So this is a Pinus contorta, uh, a two-needle pine. Um, Pinus contorta, uh, the common name is shore pine or coast pine, or also known as lodgepole pine. Uh, this pine, uh, the needles are about two, two and a half uh, inches long. It's a two needle pine, kind of like the same thing as the uh, Scotch pine or Scots pine, Pinus sylvestris, and same thing as the Japanese black pine, which is also a two needle pine, uh, Pinus thumbergia. And it's a two needle pine because there's two needles on each bundle of needles or fascicle. Some, some pines, like the white pines, are five needle pines. And there are some three needle pines. This is a two needle pine. And so uh, this is again called the coast pine. It is native to the coastal areas of the Pacific Northwest, specifically Oregon. And um, it's, its cousin, it's the same variety, lodgepole pine is native, it grows natively in central Oregon. And in that case, they grow in straight um, um, poles. Uh, they're not contorted like, like the ones on the coast. They grow tall and slender, hence the term lodgepole. They're used for making log cabins. And maybe the Indians use them for lodges. I don't know. But anyway, so this one, these, this tree is about 50 years old. Um, I worked for two owners of this house. And the original owner uh, had the house built and had these and had a landscape architect. Uh, these would have been brought in, and so they, they might have already been 20 or 30 years old when he brought them in. So who knows how old they are? I'm guessing that they're probably at least 50, or 50 years old, maybe 60 years old, these, these pine trees. So they're pretty mature, as you can see. Uh, they have been pruned in a Japanese style. Um, there's actually nine of them on this property but this particular one i'm going to do a demonstration of how how we prune it in the Niwaki style and to be real specific Niwaki is more the layered uh pom-pom look or topiary look um so the specific term uh is the sukashi s-u-k-a-s-h-i sukashi so sukashi japanese style of pruning is where, where uh, a tree is pruned more in a natural open style. Uh, the the uh, Niwaki style, and it's Niwaki, that term is used, it's N-I-W-A-K-I. Niwaki is used generically to refer to garden trees. That's what the word means, garden trees. And it is refers to all garden trees in a Japanese garden that are pruned in a Japanese style. But specifically, it's those that are pruned more in what we call cloud pruning. Uh, that's my best understanding, studying the books and listening to the, the people that have more knowledge on these things than I do as far as the terms go. And so uh, the Niwaki is actually um, pruning, establishing layers or pads. Uh, each layer is called a pad or a tier. There's different terms. And um, where the, the cloud pruning is is now that's pruned each tier or layer on the tree is pruned to look like a cloud it looks like clouds kind of floating out there uh, and that's an element in the japanese garden sometimes they want the trees to look like you know they're up there at, you know, a little bit higher than everything else it looks like clouds green clouds floating in the garden and that's not what we're doing here um, we're we're doing the sukashi which is again a more open airy natural look, which you naturally see in in the wilds, um, along the headlands of a, of a coast area, like in Oregon, or up on the, in a wind area, windy area, uh, windswept area, like the Columbia River Gorge between Oregon and Washington, or uh, up in the Cascade Mountains, where we see a lot of these, not this variety, but there's other kinds of pines and hemlocks, and also firs, miniaturized ones that grow in a kind of a bonsai style. So I will be using bonsai. Bonsai means small pots. So those are the plants that grow in small pots and they're pruned with tiny little pruners and 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 they're they're miniaturized. And the bonsai is different than this, but a lot in that we 
we keep the tree small and I do bonsai as well but uh, in, this is a personal as a personal hobby but the uh, what we use the same principles same pruning principles just applied on a larger level to, to give it a real naturalistic look so anyway that's what, what I'll be doing here it is uh, the end of December so the weather is is rather cold uh, today's warmer than it has been it has been below freezing for a few days we had s snow and ice uh, recently uh, just a few days ago and now it's rather warm it's in the 40s uh, Fahrenheit 40 degree somewhat uh, in the 40s Fahrenheit uh, and um, and this is a fine time to be pruning these trees uh, they can be pruned any time of the year uh, now the the, cat, the coast pines we do not prune them during the growing season and there's that's because there's a specific um, uh, moth it's called the sequoia pitch moth that gets into the trees um, and it causes um, you don't see it so much on this tree but some of these other ones you see globules of pitch so the sequoia pitch moth is a moth that if you prune during the summertime the the scent of the pitch exuding from the, the freshly cut wounds of the tree attracts the moth and it will then burrow in and and eat into the tree into the vascular system and into the heartwood of the tree now this is not lethal to the tree it just looks ugly because the tree exudes a lot of pitch and you got big pitch globules so this particular variety we're not pruning during the summertime now let me just say this also so I've been taking care of this property for two owners for 20 years. Uh, all the shearing, and all of that. But I have not been doing the pine trees because the previous owner had, had he was a, a farmer, a wealthy farmer and a rancher guy. And he had a lot of employees working for him on his farms and his ranches. He had a beautiful, this beautiful home on the river was his uh, in town home. And he always, he had one of his Hispanic workers come and prune the pines. So I never got to do it. And the Hispanic worker, whoever it was, I don't know who it was, did a, a fairly good job. These trees have been maintained very well. Now, the new owner of, of the house, the, the previous owner, his wife died and he was up in his 80s and he, he sold his property about three years ago. And a new owner moved in. And the new owner really has a has, is, is very sensitive and is very particular about these trees. And that's why he's hired me. Now, previously he had uh, these, these trees have not been pruned in about two years. And since the, the, the person own, owning the place now has lived here for three years, he, he's had them pruned once. I don't know who pruned them. They didn't do a bad job. They didn't do anything that was irreversible as far as the structure or, or it was deleterious to the, to the well-being of the tree. But they didn't do a good job either. I've already pruned several of the trees around here and um, they, they, there's a lot of um, crisscrossing branches that, and dead branches in the, in, inside this tree that, that they could have taken out to give the tree a more uniform look where all the architecture and the structure of the trees are all flowing kind of in the same direction instead of crisscrossing branches, duplicating branches, branches laying on top of each other. And they also kind of opened it up more so you have individual tiers or paths. And so I'm going in and I'm, I'm working on that. Uh, and, and basically it's kind of a, at this point it's a two-step process. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go through and I'm going to open it up. I've already, you see down here, I've already been doing some, some clipping. But I'm going to open it up and it's a little bit thick on the top. Um, and we want to, a lot of these pines, people don't do a lot of pruning on the top. But this is where the, the trees typically grow the fastest and put on the most growth is on the top. Why? Because uh, that's where they get the most sunlight. Uh, and that's where those top branches get the most sunlight so they can proliferate. Also, a tree, because it's apically dominant or, or has apical dominance, it puts most of its resources in the, into the top of its crown. Why? Because in a forest, 
and this isn't in the forest, but trees are just geared that way genetically, they want to grow up. They want to outgrow their neighbors and outgrow their competition so they can reach the light. They need light for photosynthesis. So typically you're gonna get more foliage on the top of these trees than on the bottom. So typically, and this isn't such a good example, but some of the other ones I've done, the tops have been so thick, they look like a mushroom. You couldn't even see through them. And, and, uh, and then the bottoms were kind of mo moderate as far as denseness of foliage, and then the bottoms were really thin. So in situations like that, we, we, it's typical, and you know, this number can be played with depending on the tree, but typically we'll cut out maybe 50%, thin the top about 50%, the middle part about 30%, and the bottom part about 10%. Okay, so that way then what this does is this equalizes the tree. Because what we want to do is we don't want to look at a tree where it's really thick on the top, or really thick on the bottom, or really thick in the middle, and the rest is all thinned out and it looks, it looks fake. We want to equalize the, the, the foliage denseness of the tree so it's uniform throughout. Why? Well, first of all, it's, it's the best thing for the tree to let light come through the tree, let light, if it's open on the top, light can filter down and it can feed, then the branches inside can uh, proliferate and, fol and, and foliate and, and be healthy because they're getting light and they can photosynthesize. If we are too thick on top, then light doesn't get down and all the interior branches start to die. And one of the things that in Japanese pruning is you don't want, is you don't want inside of the tree to be stripped out so that all you guys little puffs of foliage on the ends that's bad pruning and that's not you know what we what we want to see we want for beauty for aesthetics we want to see um, multiple layers uh, and and and, and um, pads and foliage inside outside and in the middle so the tree has a more of a three-dimensional look and so you're not just looking like I say a bunch of bunch of uh, sticks with tufts of branches on the outside. So that's why we need to have light coming all the way through. And that's why I'm going to be going in here and thinning this out. So um, the uh, first step that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be thinning out, taking out big wood. So I'm basically using three three uh, types of pruners here. I've got my Felco's, Felco pruners here, which are it's good for just about everything. And uh, these are the long handle variety, so you can actually you can actually get more leverage on this long part. I can cut a pretty thick branch. I just put an edge on them, and so they, uh, they're pretty sharp. And then I have my uh, silky, you can see it's well used, uh, but it's sharp, it's very sharp. And I have a silky saw here, and a silky, uh, this is what, most pruning arborists who really know their metal, they use Silky. Silky is a Japanese brand, it's Japanese steel, and, and it's, they're very good. And this particular saw, I like this one because it's got fine teeth at the very end for starting your cut so you don't rip the bark. And it's got, it's got more coarse teeth down here for, um, for making big cuts quickly. So you start your cut up here w w with the end, and then you finish it on the bottom part where it saws a lot faster. And that way you don't rip the bark because if you start it on really thin bark trees, such as, it's not such an issue with, the, with these pines, but let's say you're doing Japanese maples, especially in the summer, in the springtime, when they're, um, they got a lot of water coming up, there's not a lot of adhesion between the bark and the, uh, the vascular wood because there's so much water in there and, and the bark can peel off very easily. So we like to start with our cut, start up here. The other thing that I use, these are my, these are my uh, Japanese. Uh, these are called, well, we call them pruners uh, in our hand pruners in America, but in England and elsewhere they call them secateurs. Um, and and this, you'll hear that term if you're listening to um, uh, pruners uh, from England and maybe other countries. They call these secateurs, um, and uh, that's that's another name for pruner. And then I have these. This, this tool is really helpful for, for candle cutting because you can get in there with your fingers and for needle pruning and that kind of thing. You'll see, you'll see, uh, see me do that later. So 
So anyway, the first thing, this, this tree is going to be done in about, doing it in about three different levels, three different steps. First of all, I'm going to go through it, cut out, I'm going to cut out all the, uh, the wood that I don't want. I'm going to cut out stuff that's going down, stuff that's going up, and stuff that's crossing other things. And I'm going to keep the strongest branches, and I'm going to uh, cut out dead wood. I see dead wood in there that others have left and have not cut out before me. Um, and I'm going to establish the pads or the layers. And in so doing, I'm going to open this tree up. I start at that process because I don't want to remove, I don't want to do fine pruning and end up having to remove a branch I've already pruned on. That's inefficient. So we remove the big wood first that is obscuring the structure of the tree and also um, obscuring or uh, uh, infringing on the various layers that we want to establish. So you're going to see as I as I go through, the tree's going to, be, going to open up and you're going to be able to see layers. Uh, typically, often the, the guys, the Japanese pruners will start at the top and work their way down. But in this case, I'm not worried about that. This isn't that big of a tree. They do that so that if it's a taller tree, they they can uh, uh, they clean as they go. They 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 shake the stuff down, the, the the prunings until it all falls to the bottom. In this case, I'm not going to worry about that because I'm not really going to be doing what we call needle pruning uh, on this tree. That's a that's another process, another thing. That's where once you get the tree where you want it, you get all the layers established, um, and then you don't have to come back and do that again. You just maintain, and 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 you do candle pruning every year because every year the new growth of candles go out, so you've got to clip it, clip them back so the tree doesn't keep getting bigger and bigger. Because you've got to keep it contained to uh, to the spot where it's at. So candle pruning, typically that should be done while the candles are still fresh and you can use your fingers to clip them out. That way you don't damage the needles. You can use pruners and some people do that, but you end up cutting, if you use pruners to cut the candles, you end up cutting the needles and then the tips of the needles that you cut grow, get brown and they die and it looks bad. So candle pruning takes place usually in the spring after the candles have grown. So here in Western Oregon and before they've hardened off, probably be doing that in May or June, May or June at the latest and that way they just you can just snip them off and that's a whole nother discussion as to how to candle prune uh, the new growth and you want to do it while they're still tender otherwise they, during the summertime they harden off and then you will need to use pruners in this case these candles have not been pruned in a while so I'm going to candle prune and I will be using these pruners to candle prune. I'll be reaching in a diagonal so I don't clip the needles and I'll be going with the flow of the needles to cut the candles off. And I'll talk about that. There is a method to the madness and I'll talk about that when we get to that point. So basically I'm going to thin it out and then I'm going to go uh, uh, candle prune. As I'm candle pruning, I'll knock out the dead needles also. You can see this tree, this tree is very old. Look at all the mosses and lichens growing on it. It's really beautiful. So anyway, I'm going to get in here and I'm going to cut off. Uh, I'm going to cut off. I'm looking for branches that are um, kind of growing up and also that are obscuring the, the structure of the tree. So, um, like this one here. And this one starts clear in here, and see, it goes clear out here like that, and it's between this pad and that pad. So this guy's going to come off. This has been growing for a long time. So I'm gonna take them off. And this isn't a real strong branch anyway. It's got it's got some it's got some branches in the outside, but there's not it's not a real strong solid pad. It's not one that I'm now here's another one. This branch, a beautiful branch, but look it's laying on top of this one. And I guess I could leave that one because it kind of fills a hole there and I could remove this guy, leave this lower pad and lose leave and um, and cut this one off. So actually, I think because if I take this off, it's going to be leave a big hole here. So I'm actually going to take. Look, it's better to go slower rather than faster. You can always take them off, but once they're off, you can't put them back on. Actually, I'm going to take this 
whole thing off like that one and I'm just going through here looking for big branches okay here's one right here this branch look at how this sneaks up in here this isn't even a real healthy branch it just sneaks it winds around it sneaks up in here it comes between this one and this one and it obscures the view and it, it just kind of confuses things so that branch is coming off get rid of him and uh, let's see here again I'm looking for big branches here's a branch here this little tiny branch here look at this he's not doing anything we got a nice pad here nice pad here nice pad here and we got this little guy in between the whole thing there's starting to be some dieback on the inside here which is not good because it's getting thick getting way too thick it should have been probably been pruned out thinned out years ago but it didn't somebody was afraid there's a lot a lot of pruners who are not confident they're afraid to make cuts and I, I don't blame them you know but you, what is you after you've been doing it for a while you get confident and uh, and, and then you don't worry about it you know what you're doing and uh, but some people are afraid of over pruning and you know you can kill trees too by over pruning them um, I did that once <laughs> that was the last time I over pruned a pine tree in a Japanese style when I was just kind of learning it's been many years ago I over pruned it and it died um, and uh, I, I, I haven't made that mistake since. In a minute, after I cut, get through and cut some of these out, we're going to step back and we're going to look at the pine from outside, out on the street. And you're going to begin to see that it's beginning to open up. You're going to be able to see the structure on the inside, which is pretty cool. It's going to look more open and start to start to see the branching structure. So right now I'm pruning um, the branches for ramification. Ramification is the is the term. So this, this I'm pruning stuff that goes up and stuff that goes down. This branch goes straight up, and I'm pruning stuff that goes down. We're trying to get layers. We want flat layers, more or less flat, um, and that's 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 how we get uh, ramification or the, the branches spreading out. And right now I'm promoting ramification through um, selectively um, cutting branches that, um, that are um, basically growing in the wrong direction. And I'm trying to get everything kind of growing in the same direction and remove branches too that are obscuring um, the layers from um, happening. So you see, I'm trying to differenti differentiate the layers. And like this branch, this comes out here at a right angle to the, the, that branch that is on, so that's coming off. And um, cut this guy off too. See, doesn't that simplify that? Doesn't that look, now this branch grows back in. We're cutting stuff that goes back in on itself too, back in toward the center of the tree. We want stuff growing out, not back in, generally speaking. I'm gonna cut this guy off here. It's a big one. Let's see, we don't really need him. We got this nice pad up here. Doesn't that, doesn't that look a whole lot better? We'll knock some of these dead needles off. Just a, just, that was a, just kind of a cluttered mess. Kind of thinning the pads too, because some of them are really thick. And we want to, I'll cut off the dead, the dead stuff. Oh, there's a lot of dead. Somebody who pruned this before didn't really do, they, they left, they, they pruned, made some bad pruning cuts. And as a result, the, the branch that they pruned on died. This branch comes clear over the top of this one. So he's coming off. Here's a dead branch. Again, if the branches get too thick, and they can't get sunlight, they die. No light, death. I'm starting to get a little more fine pruning now. Um, and remember, we're trying to equalize. Um, every so often, I'll be stepping back to um, 
look at the tree as a whole and trying to uh, look at it from the the, the, ma the micro or the macro perspective, the big perspective. Okay, so when we get to the top of the tree, this is kind of the top. On the top, obviously, we need to have branches that go up because you got to have a top on the tree. When we're, we're talking down below, the branches will, will go out. We want the foliage to go up on the branches, but the branches to kind of droop down. Uh, sometimes the Japanese will put weights on these branches and will tie them down. Or if they're small, they'll wire them. Not so much on a tree of this size, but they'll actually wire them so they bend down. The reason for this is because a tree, as it gets older, the branches begin to droop. It's kind of like a human being. You get older, you get become an elderly senior citizen. Actually, I'm a senior citizen and I'm elderly, I guess by some people's standards. I'm 63, but I, my branches aren't drooping, but I still have, tendency, have the tendency to slouch sometimes. I gotta keep my back straight. But you find people that don't have good posture that begin to slouch, hunch over, and next thing you know, they're kind of walking around like this. Next thing you know, they're dragging their knuckles on the ground. <laughs> Not quite, but anyway. But the trees are the same way. They get old, the wood fibers, after years of fighting the wind, maybe uh, uh, ice on their branches and causing the sag and causing the wood fibers to, to tweak and to stretch, and maybe snow uh, weighting them down. And, they, and again, they, they get weighted down. And event, an old tree, will the branches will be weighted down and they'll be kind of aiming down. Um, and but the but the the needles will be facing up because needles, even though they may be on a branch that's drooping down, they're still reaching for the sky. They're still reaching for light because that's they got it. They're like solar panels. They've got a um, these. This is a solar array. All these needles are all facing the sun. If you've ever had a house plant in a window in your house, and you you notice and, and the sun is facing a certain direction all the leaves will be facing that direction and then you turn the plant around so the leaves are facing away from the window and in toward the house you notice in a, in a week or two all the leaves will be facing back toward the sun again so needles array, arrange themselves and leaves arrange themselves to be facing the sun so anyway um, i am so that's why we want the branches to be uh, layered a certain way all going in the same direction um, uh, uh, reaching out for the sun, not reaching back in where it's dark and shadow, uh, shady inside. And on the top, we want the branches, we want a top, we want it to be uh, reaching up. I haven't really even gotten to the top yet, but we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there little by little. Right now, I'm trying to differentiate. We've got two pads here that are really growing close to each other. And I think cut that whole thing off right there like that and it's not bad to have some branches growing on the inside too so again right now I'm still thinning and eventually when we get done with the thinning and we got everything all equalized as far as the denseness of the foliage then I'm going to go through and I'm going to start cutting some of the candles back and I will I will um, I will um, We'll talk about that in a minute. Well, maybe not a minute, maybe a half an hour. <laughs> There's not a right or a wrong way to to go about pruning these things. The Japanese, God bless them, you know, they've been doing this for thousands of years, or at least 12, 1500 years, and they got it from the Chinese who were doing it before them. So I have all the respect in the world for the Chinese and the Japanese pruning masters. Who am I? They have thousands, several couple thousand years of handed down tradition, how they do things. I am not here to criticize or critique that. Um, I have all the respect in the world. But I'm not so concerned about how you go about pruning as to that is exactly the methodology Pruning techniques, yes, but as far as how you go about it. Some people start at the top of the tree, work their way down. Some people start at the bottom, work their way up. Most of the time it's toward the top. But 
and, and, and some will work on one branch and do everything all at once, and get it all to exactly how they want and go to the next branch. I take a more holistic approach and I doubt I'm the only one that does this, but I'm an artist. I'm an academic, academically trained um, graphic and fine art uh, artist as in oils and, and drawing and, and, and uh, watercolor and that kind of thing. Uh, and so when I'm painting, uh, when, I'm, when I am uh, sculpting a tree, I rough it in. I take out the, I take out the big wood, I, I kind of get it where I want it all the way around and then I begin to hone in on it. It's kind of like um, a sculptor um, uh, with a block of stone, a block of marble. Um, he doesn't just say he's got a square block of marble and he's going to make a statue out of it. He doesn't um, carve out an arm out of that block of stone and then begin um, working on all the fine details down to the fingers and the and the fingernails and the lines in the fingers and all that. And meanwhile, the rest of the statue is a block of stone. Now he roughs it in. He kind of uh, he kind of begins to rough in the whole statue, and he begins to little by little work on the details and bring the whole thing into focus, all holistically. And then he begins to work on the details. Once he's got all the arms and the legs and the head and the torso and all of those things. Then he begins a little bubble work on the details. And that's what we're doing here. I'm kind of going around, just hovering around and, and working on details. And, and, and I mean, not working on details yet, but I'm, I'm just kind of like looking for thick areas. And, and then I'll start working on the details later. That will be the next phase. That's my style of pruning. You, others may have a different style of pruning. But that's what I do. That's how I prune all my trees uh, for the last 40 years that I've been pruning these kinds of things. Okay, so I have gone through and pretty well thinned out the wood, as you can see. They're all pretty equalized throughout the whole crown of the tree. And you can actually look through the top. It's still thick in a few spots, and I'll, I'll fine tune that. And you can look on the ground here and see how much wood I took out. I took out a lot of wood. Uh, it's taken me about a half an hour to do this. And now I'm going to go through, I'm going to start doing some uh, candle pruning. So get a good look at this tree. It's still pretty rough. I'm going to go in and some of these candles have gotten rather long. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to start, I'm going to go through each branch. This is what's going to take the longest. I'm going to go through each branch and I'm going to literally very discreetly very carefully evaluate each branchlet not each branch you got the trunk the branch the twigs and the twiglets and um, i'm going to go through each twig and twiglet and i am not just going to indiscriminately cut i'm going to cut back to a bud to a little branchlet that comes out and because right now it's still Pretty shaggy, rather ratty. This is where I'm going to ask the cameraman, my son, to zoom in. So I'm going to, we'll start out here on the front where it's the easiest. And we, these candles have not, they've been let go. And also, I'm, and they haven't been pruned in a couple years. And I'm, this is heavy, heavy pruning. This tree is getting some heavy pruning. And I'll just say this, I'm not going to be doing any needle pruning at this time because I don't want to take away so much foliage from this tree, even though it's a very healthy tree, but I don't want to take so much foliage away that it has a hard time producing food. So we don't want to over prune. Um, uh, several years ago, a couple years ago, in this neighborhood, another tree service came in and over pruned. I think it was another, uh, much larger, um, there were three of them, a much larger coast pine. I mean, the trunks were about this big around and they were like uh, 25 feet tall and they're literally large trees. But they came in in the summertime and they over pruned. They pruned out about 50% of the foliage. And I said, yikes, those trees are going to die. Well, sure enough, in the summertime, they didn't have enough food, to enough foliage to produce and it shocked them so badly that they died. Two of them died and I got a call from the people 
uh, because I do a lot of work in the neighborhood and for the neighbors, and and um, I had to look for these people. I said, can you save the remaining tree? I said, yes, I, I believe I can. You need to give it water, and then we'll fertilize it. And so that's what we that's what we uh, we did. So we're on the edge of a, a, a pavement here, a road. So I got to keep this trimmed back. And every single cut, I'm cutting back to a little branchlet, back to a, a, a strong shoot of some kind or the other. Otherwise, this thing will just keep growing out and it's already overhanging the curb. You can see the curb down here. This is a this is a road. This flower bed, this shrub bed is on the edge of, of the road. It out over the road. So it's very important that I that we keep this trimmed back so it, it doesn't hit up against cars that are driving by or the garbage truck or whatever. So I'm cutting literally with these little scissors and I'm also knocking the dead needles off as I go. So I'm doing thinning, but I can't just cut in internodally. I probably could here, because this is not real hardened off, but I'm concerned, I, 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 you know, we're late in the season. The time to be cutting internodally is more in the spring when the growth is you can cut internodally on a fresh candle that's still very tender wood and maybe cut a third of it back or half of it back. If you do it like in, in, in here in Oregon, Western Oregon, in May, maybe early June, because you still have another month worth of growing season and before the summer heats hit uh, and the trees go into dormancy, the, the summer that the hot weather hits and they stop growing. Um, so if you, if you, you can, if the candle is still really tender and you clip off about half of it, uh, it will still be called back bud. And these will, these coast pines will back bud. They back bud. One bud, uh, I believe. Um, some trees will, will you can get a, it's called a, a, get another flush, or or you can get a couple back buddies. I see the Japanese black black pines. I don't get to work on those very often. They're not real common around here. Those, my understanding is, they back bud twice. You can get two back budding, and 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 that's so that you can miniaturize the tree and mini, miniaturize the needles. Um, that's kind of the principle of bonsai is miniaturization. But on these. This tree here, um, we're not, I'm, I'm, I'm candle pruning back to existing buds or branchlets, and I'm not cutting internodally on the candles because I don't want to lose that, that, um, that whole branch. But I am cutting back to little tiny, see little, little shoots back here. And, um, uh, uh, and then the, the tree will put its energy into those shoot, this, let's say this shoot, and then I can probably eventually cut this one off and just get the tree pushed back or miniaturized or whatever you want to call it. Like here's a little here's a little, uh, little branch coming out here. So I'm going to cut off the long one in the middle. And eventually we'll probably be able to cut that off and this branch will be our new terminus of that branch. So here on this one, there's a little little branch coming out there, and here's a little branch coming out here, and 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 so we're going to get ramification. What do I mean? By if I'm careful and I cut properly, I can cut out the middle branch and leave the ones that are spreading on either side at 45 degree angles, or, or, or cut off the the uh, the branch, um, the candle that's in the middle, and like here we have a whole bunch of branches. Cut off the ones that go up, and I'm going to leave one that goes this way and one that goes that way to promote ramification. So we're going to get ramification or a pad or a layer because I'm pruning the branches to go that way. Okay, we want to we want to spread out horizontally, not vertically this way or vertically that way, up or down. And I'm not saying that somebody couldn't be doing a little differently than what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. You know, everybody's got a little different 
decision, you know, what, where they where they might cut or where they may, might not cut. And that's where the individuality of the pruner comes in and the discretion of the pruner. You notice how already this is starting to look a little bit more less scruffy looking. This area that I pruned through here and I'll cut off this guy. And we got little buds in here. We'll just let them kind of come forth. Cut him off. He's over the top of the other ones. It doesn't look at this. Doesn't this start to look a little bit nicer? So this is another pair of pruners, so Japanese style pruners that I like to use. And these are these needle pointed ones are really great for getting in here. And I can go even a lot faster than those other scissors I was using. I'm opening that up, getting nice ramification going on in there. Uh, getting getting a, a nice pad, if you will. See, look at this. I'm, I'm removing the stuff that's going straight up and, and back. And we're getting, getting some nice definition, I think. All right, so we pretty much have the front of this done. Look how, look how much, it's just not so cluttered. It looks more beautiful. Uh, I'm going to start working my way. Put the back of this at the top. Probably have another uh, hour on this. 